Hey folks, and welcome back to American Lit. Um, in Unit 2, we're going to be talking about modernism, and we're also going to be looking at how some authors um, define things like life and love and self. So in this lecture video, we're going to be talking about the modernist movement in American literature, as well as the authors William Carlos Williams, Zora Neale Hurston, and Edna St. Vincent Millay. And then we're also going to look at what assignments you have due in this unit and look ahead to see if there's anything you need to be aware of. So let's talk about what caused the modern movement. If you think back to the last lecture, um, we talked about realism and just sort of this idea um, that art should match real life. Um, and here in the modern movement, that idea is really going to be challenged and um, a lot of it has to do with some major um, events that happen in the world. So for the most part, when people or critics talk about the modern movement, we're talking about the time period from about 1915 to about 1945. And a lot of historians see this as sort of America's coming of age. Um, you know, America has been this experiment of freedom and democracy, or at least freedom for some people at this point. And we're going to see what that means um, to these artists and authors. So in a lot of ways, people were attempting to reconstruct this world without the image of God. Um, during this time period, you have this major shift from religion to things like um, humanity, art, and science. And um, people, not just authors and artists, use humanity and art and science to really kind of define what the world is and what it means and look to answer those really big questions that sometimes religion answered in the past. There's also um, a lot of really important um, historical, cultural, and economic events that are going on during this time period. So the modern um, literary period starts pretty much with World War I. Um, and this causes the disillusionment of so many artists and authors. Um, World War I was known as the Great War. It was really challenging because a lot of people had a hard time understanding um, how humans could be so violent and evil. Um, and there was also a lot of disillusionment with sort of technology and progression during this time. So we have, um, you know, Poland meets Germany on the battlefield. Germany is in tanks and the Polish army is on horseback. So there's this huge clash of sort of old world and new world. Um, and the fact that technology was being used to take so many lives and to hurt so many people was really difficult um, for a lot of people struggling to understand this. I mean, we lose 8.7 million people in World War I. And so you have just sort of these horrific things that are happening overseas. Um, and then back home, it's not better. There's extreme racism going on in the United States during this time. We have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, and we have the Red Summer Riots of 1919. So these really big things that are happening um, that, you know, obviously are indicating that it's not safe for a lot of Americans um, to just simply exist. And so people are really struggling with that. In 1920, um, the 19th Amendment is passed, which gives women the right to vote. And also a lot of people struggled with this. You have men and women who believe very strongly that women have the right to vote, but you also have men and women who believe very strongly that they shouldn't. And so this question of sort of like, what is a woman's role in the home, in society, you know, these are really um, being challenged. And so we see this reflected in a lot of art. Um, you have the Roaring Twenties, you have Prohibition, um, you know, we sort of have this like jazz age, um, and it's going to be pretty significant in terms of how it affects culture. And then in 1929, of course, the stock market crashes, which starts the Great Depression in the United States. And for a lot of people, there's this idea 
that America can work for everybody. And we really see that idea challenged in the Great Depression, this idea of American ingenuity and pulling yourselves up by the bootstraps. And if you work hard, you can provide yourself. I mean, that idea is just proven totally false during the Great Depression. There are lots of people who are more than willing to work hard and they still can't meet basic needs. Um, and so we see this reflected in the art as well. And then the last sort of major event um, here during this time period is World War II. So World War II started in 1939. And it's so frustrating for so many people during this time because they're still dealing with the remnants of the last World War. And there's kind of this like, I can't believe we're about to do this again feeling, um, you know, morality ethics, all of these things are huge questions for people. What is the right thing to do? Should we be involved in the war? Should we not be involved in the war? How do we treat people? Um, you know, racism is still a huge deal in the world and in America at this time. Um, there are a lot of people who are very um, disheartened and upset about the way that Nazi Germany is treating the Jewish people, but there are a lot of Americans that are not concerned with that. We have Nazi rallies in, you know, the United States in the late 30s, early 40s. Um, you know, we have the internment of Japanese American citizens, despite the fact that they committed no crimes and did nothing wrong. And so there's, you know, all of these questions of what is it acceptable for a nation to do um, and what is not acceptable, what is unmoral and unethical. So these are just some of the questions that this um, movement attempts to answer with its art and literature. Um, we see this in everything from um, fine art to music to theater to poetry to novels. Um, even, you know, like the fine art from this time period looks very different than art from the realism time period. And artists feel that they need new forms or new art forms to express these feelings that they have, feelings of anxiety or alienation or even dislocation. And so if you look up art, um, you know, modern art, we can see a lot of that. So let's talk about what's happening in literature where all these major events are happening in the world. So the most significant feature of this time period is experimentation. Um, artists and poets experiment with both style and subject matter. So this is how you present your art and what your art is about. So um, we're going to see this in the poets that we look at today. Um, William Carlos Williams really experiments with subject matter. What is a good subject matter for a poem? Um, and we find that it can be anything. We're going to look in just a minute at his poem, The Red Wheelbarrow. Um, Edna St. Vincent Millay, she really experiments a lot with subject matter. What is it okay for a poet to discuss? And what is it not okay for a poet to discuss? Um, so one poet, Ezra Pound, famously says during this time period, make it new. Now he's a great poet. He's one of my favorites. We didn't um, get a chance to read him this semester, but he's in your textbook. You can go look him up. Um, but this sort of becomes a rallying cry for writers who participated in this cultural movement, right? Make it new, reinvent it, do, um, do something new. And we see that um, the literary forms are innovative and they're often challenging. So here's where we get this idea um, that the author doesn't have to hold the reader's hand. Um, they can expect them to do some work to, um, to ascertain the meaning of what is behind it. And writers were also willing to disrupt the traditional notions of things like order, sequence, and unity. Um, they're okay for their work to be a little bit incoherent or a little bit confusing for the sake of experimentation. Um, we see, you know, stream of consciousness really begins to flourish during this era. Um, authors like William Faulkner really perfect this art. Um, and we have some themes that pop up in modern literature and just kind of a representative of this time. So the first one is alienation. I feel different than those around me and I don't quite know what to do with it. 
or existentialism. You know, this is where we ask those big questions of why are we here? Why do we exist? What is the purpose of humanity? Um, is the world really a terrible place that we have to endure? Or um, is it a good place that's gotten kind of messed up? What is the meaning beyond all of this? And the last one up here is primitivism. Just sort of this idea of going back to the primitive, back to the basics, back to simplicity, um, and getting rid of everything that is overly complicated. Um, so let's talk about modernism in poetry. So instead of predict predictable rhymes and forms, a lot of modern poetry is a little bit chaotic. It's meant to sort of mirror the randomness of modern life and challenge the reader's notion of order. Um, so we see this in Ezra Pound, we see this in William Carlos Williams, we see this in T.S. Eliot, we see this in Gertrude Stein. If you look at these poets, you sort of get this idea of their experimentation with style. Um, we definitely, you know, we definitely see this in the poems that you read by Williams. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to look at. But remember that that um, there's no monolith, right? There's no single rule for any time period or even any poet. Um, and so some poets didn't necessarily um, abandon all predictable rhymes and forms. Like Edna St. Vincent Millay, um, she wrote a lot of sonnets, which is a very um, structured form of poetry. But she definitely um, sort of veered off the beaten path in terms of subject matter and what she wrote about, but maybe not necessarily as much in rhyme or form. Okay, let's talk about William Carlos Williams. He was born in 1883 in New Jersey, and sort of his goal as a poet was to make the ordinary um, appear extraordinary. He actually studied to be a medical doctor, um, but wrote poetry his entire lifetime. And what he would do is he would write his direct impressions of the sensuous world around him. So he asked himself, what am I experiencing with my five senses? Um, touch, taste, smell, sight, and sound. And then he would take those impressions and translate them into poetry. Um, during the Great Depression, there's this shift in his poetry where we see these pictures that he's creating um, become pictures of what he views as wrongs in the world. Um, from maybe, you know, before that it was more um, idealistic, but during the Great Depression, he had a lot of really challenging ideas that he sought to incorporate into his poetry. So Williams just said that he felt like he was free from the constraints of literary rules that came before him. He said, I don't want to follow the rules, so I don't have to follow the rules. And he really set the tone for a lot of modernist poetry um, and poets that were inspired by his work. Um, he became the consultant of the Library of Congress, um, which is a job kind of like Poet Laureate before we had the term Poet Laureate. Um, and, you know, he did this for a while. He was very influential, but he was actually investigated um, by the FBI for his political sentiments. A lot of times artists and um, poets and authors um, and people answering kind of these existential questions tend to be um, a little bit more liberal or left-leaning. And so sometimes that got them in trouble when they were challenging um you know, tightly held conservative ideas. Okay, let's look at his poem, The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rain water beside the white chickens. Um, so this is kind of just this snapshot, this picture, this thing that he's seeing and experiencing and in a lot of ways it's simple but it also we can pull a lot of meaning out of it um, you know it kind of reminds us to slow down the cadic rhythm that he has um, and you know the the breaks in between the lines um, just help us take it a little bit slower and to see what he is seeing on um, when he opens the poem with so much depends on he doesn't tell us what actually is depending on it 
but we get the idea that maybe it's, um, you know, somebody's livelihood. Maybe it's a farm, and so it's actually something that's useful here. It's just this beautiful kind of um, picture that he creates with his words. Okay, let's talk about Zora Neale Hurston. Um, so Hurston was born in 1891. Both of her parents um, were slaves, and so she really comes out of this, um, you know, time period where not much is expected of African Americans. She was a beloved author as well as an anthropologist, and she really studied um, black culture and African American culture. We see a lot of that in her work. You know, there's a lot of um, AAVE or African American vernacular English in her work, and this is celebrated um, and preserved so beautifully in her work. Um, so when she was a child, her family moved to Eatonville, Florida, where her father would later become mayor. Um, Eatonville was, it's just north of Orlando, and it was started as um, an all-black town um, where black people had the opportunity to flourish and to celebrate their culture and their life. And she actually writes about that in um, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. And then we see this setting in um, her book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Um, she attended Barnard College in New York City. And this is where and when she became heavily involved in the Harlem Renaissance. So Hurston wrote prolifically. She wrote novels, she wrote plays, um, she wrote Mule Bone with Langston Hughes, who we're going to study um, in the next unit. She was also a drama teacher. She taught at the North Carolina College for Negroes. Um, and though her work is um, praised now, she's a well-renowned author, a lot of times she didn't receive very much or any pay at all for her written work during her lifetime. So she lived for decades in debt and poverty, which is just a tragedy when you consider all that she contributed to American literature. So she has this essay called How It Feels to be Colored Me, where she just talks about her experiences um, as a woman, as a black woman, just her personally. And there's some really great themes that are brought up in this work. Um, she talks about race as a social construct and the day she becomes colored is the word um, that she uses and how it was something that she became aware of rather than an inherent part of herself. Um, she kind of talks about the identity of performance and when is she being herself and when is she performing. She talks about race in American society and how you know, sometimes she's not welcome or she doesn't feel like she belongs simply because of the color of her skin. And she also deals with, you know, this rejection of victimhood. She says that she is going to celebrate everything that she is and she expects those around her to celebrate her too. So it's this really beautiful piece of just self-exploration and self-identifying um, I hope that you enjoy reading it. We're going to talk at the end of this lecture a little bit about something that you're going to do similar to this um, in Unit 3. Okay, now let's talk about Sweat, which is her short story. Um, so we have this um, character, Delia. Um, so Delia and her physical labor, her sweat, if you will, is the only thing that she has to keep herself cared for. Um, Delia cannot rely on her community or her husband. Um, and so, you know, we get this picture of this woman who's really struggling to sort of figure out who she is and um, what her role is in her home or her marriage, in her community, um, all of these things. There's a lot of black and white imagery in this story and we get it in terms of like race as in you know black and white people we get it in terms of like laundry as in clean and dirty but we also get it in sort of like more symbolic things as in good and evil there's also this really great connection between snakes and her husband sykes um so 
Uh, Delia is afraid of her husband, and she's also afraid of snakes. Um, and the similarity in their names is probably not incidental. Um, but there's, you know, sort of this image that um, Sites is a snake or something cannot be trusted. He's very abusive of her, um, you know, and snakes are kind of seen as um, evil creatures or tricksters or something like that. Um, we also get a lot of symbolism and connection between the ideas of slavery and marriage. Delia is not happy in her marriage, but she doesn't have anything that she can do about it. And we also see this same theme pop up in um, Hurston's book, um, Their Eyes Were Watching God. So this is how the short story ends. Um, this is the last sentence from the story, and I just love it. It says, she could scarcely reach the chinaberry tree, where she waited in the growing heat, while inside she knew the cold river was creeping up and up to distinguish that I which must know by now that she knew. And so we see Delia in this last sort of moment um, where she is watching her husband die from a snake bite that he intended to be hers. Um, and she kind of reclaims her identity or her strength um, by not helping him in this last moment and by making the choice to sort of watch it happen. So she obviously is not at fault for what happens. Um, she does not warn Sykes that the snake is still in there, but she also knows that Sykes put the snake in there to kill her. And so um, the fact that he is killed by the snake, not her, is sort of his comeuppance or, um, you know, karma um, dealing with this horrible, abusive man and giving Delia the chance to kind of live on her own. Okay, the last um, poet or author that we're going to talk about today um, is Edna St. Vincent Millay. So this, she is just a fascinating um, human being. Um, she really challenged a lot of commonly held ideas and beliefs at the time. Um, she was born in Maine in 1892, and she was recognized for her poetry at a young age. She won a scholarship to Vassar College. Um, she wrote poetry. She was involved in theater. A lot of her poetry um, centers on female sexuality and feminism, and this garnered her both praise and criticism. A lot of people did not know what to do with her. Um, Millay won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1923, um, and a lot of the poetry that she wrote really explored different aspects of her identity. Um, in this top picture, you can see um, on this slide, she is with um, one of her lovers, um, Millay. She was um, polyamorous, which meant that she believed that you could be in relationship or be in love with more than one person at a time. Um, and while um, she probably didn't have the vernacular for bisexual at the time, um, she also was in relationships with both men and women. So this second or this middle picture in this slide, um, I found on a website about her and it just said, um, you know, Malay with two lovers and two friends. You don't really know who is uh, which ones are the lovers and which ones are the friends. Um, but she wrote all of this wonderful love poetry. And one of the things that's so fascinating about her is that she wrote it to multiple people. Um, she, you know, wrote it to both men and women. And so she is producing this content that is really challenging at the time. And um, she kind of doesn't really care what anybody has to say about her. Um, she married in 1923 um, to a man named Eugene Bozevin, and he actually gave up his career um, to take care of her and to help her with her literary career. Um, he said things like any moment that she would spend preparing food was a moment that she could have spent writing poetry, and so why would he allow her to do the you know, less important things in life when she had to do the important work of um, 
writing poetry and you know he just absolutely adored her um they had an open marriage but um they seemed to have a very happy marriage they were together for 26 years um <coughs> excuse me during that time they both had other relationships with other people and so here you have these people that um are just living a very different lifestyle than the majority of Americans at the time and um, they're doing it proudly and without shame which is just part of the reason um, that she is so wonderful but she writes about all of this in her poetry so this is one of her sonnets um, that she wrote it's not in your textbook but I just loved it so I wanted to share it with you briefly um, this is love is not all it says love is not all it is not meat, nor drink, nor slumber, nor a roof against the rain, nor yet a floating spar to men that sink, and rise and sink, and rise and sink again. Love cannot fill the thickened lung with breath, nor clean the blood, nor set the fractured bone. Yet many a man is making friends with death, even as I speak, for lack of love alone. It well may be that in a difficult hour, pinned down by pain and moaning for release, or nagged by want past resolution's power, I may be driven to sell your love for peace, or trade the memory of this night for food. It well may be. I do not think I would. So here we have a sonnet. Remember, that's that 14-line poem written in iambic pentameter, and she's asking this question of <coughs> what is love? And she tells us what it's not. Um, it's not anything that physically sustains the body. Um, so she doesn't understand quite exactly why somebody would die without love, but she understands that they do. And she says, maybe, you know, there will be a time where my physical needs outweigh my desire for love or, you know, my memories of love. And maybe I'll trade those for what could meet my physical needs. But then she ends with, you know what, that's probably not going to happen or not a choice that I would ever make. Okay, so those are the three authors that we are reading for um, unit two. <coughs> Excuse me. Make sure that you complete your reading journal. Um, and then in the discussion board this unit, um, we are talking about definitions of love, of life, and of self. So find some evidence from the three authors that we read on how they define those things and answer those questions on the discussion board about that. And then, of course, make sure that you do your discussion board replies. And then a look ahead. So briefly, I wanted to mention to you guys that in Unit 3, we will have our first essay project of the semester <coughs> excuse me, um, you will be writing a cultural identity essay. So all of the information on this essay is already in the unit three folder. Um, go ahead, um, take a look at it just so that you can kind of be thinking about it and what you might want to write about. As always, if you have any questions, please um, send me an email, post them on the discussion board, or come see me during my office hours. Um, I hope you enjoy the readings for this unit. Y'all have a great day.